October 5, 1840 Discourse on Priesthood Minutes of the General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, held in Nauvoo, Hancock County, Illinois, beginning Saturday, October 3 to Monday, October 5, 1840. The following is the article on priesthood referred to in the conference minutes. Priesthood In order to investigate the subject of the priesthood, so important to this, as well as every succeeding generation, I shall proceed to trace the subject as far as I possibly can from the Old and New Testaments. There are two priesthoods spoken of in the scriptures, the Melchizedek and the Aaronic or Levitical. Although there are two priesthoods, yet the Melchizedek priesthood comprehends the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood, and is the grand head, and holds the highest authority which pertains to the priesthood, and the keys of the kingdom of God in all ages of the world, to the latest posterity on the earth, and is the channel through which all knowledge, doctrine, the plan of salvation, and every important matter is revealed from heaven. Its institution was prior to the foundation of this earth, where the morning stars sang together, where the sons of God shouted for joy, and is the highest and holiest priesthood. And is after the order of the Son of God, and all other priesthoods are only parts, ramifications, powers and blessings belonging to the same, and are held, controlled, and directed by it. It is the channel through which the Almighty commenced revealing His glory at the beginning of the creation of this earth and through which he has continued to reveal himself to the children of men to the present time, and through which he will make known his purposes to the end of time. Commencing with Adam, who was the first man, who is spoken of in Daniel as being the ancient of days. Or in other words, the first and oldest of Ale, the great grand progenitor, of whom it is said in another place he is Michael, because he was the first and father of all, not only by progeny but the first to hold the spiritual blessings, to whom was made known the plan of ordinances for the salvation of his posterity unto the end, and to whom Christ was first revealed. And through whom Christ has been revealed from heaven, and will continue to be revealed from henceforth. Adam holds the keys of the dispensation of the fullness of times. I.e., the dispensation of all the times have been and will be revealed through him from the beginning to Christ, and from Christ to the end of all the dispensations that are to be revealed. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, and which are on earth, even in him. Now the purpose in himself in the winding up scene of the last dispensation is that all things pertaining to that dispensation should be conducted precisely in accordance with the preceding dispensations. And again, God purposed in himself that there should not be an eternal fullness until every dispensation should be fulfilled and gathered together in one. And that all things whatsoever, that should be gathered together in one in those dispensations unto the same fullness and eternal glory, should be in Christ Jesus. Therefore he set the ordinances to be the same forever and ever, and set Adam to watch over them, to reveal them from heaven to man, or to send angels to reveal them. Are they not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? These angels are under the direction of Michael or Adam, who acts under the direction of the Lord. From the above quotation we learn that Paul perfectly understood the purposes of God, in relation to his connection with man. And that glorious and perfect order, which he established in himself, whereby he sent forth power, revelations, and glory. God will not acknowledge that which he has not called, ordained, and chosen. In the beginning God called Adam by his own voice. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and hid myself. Adam received commandments and instructions from God, this was the order from the beginning. That he received revelations, commandments and ordinances at the beginning is beyond the power of controversy, else how did they begin to offer sacrifices to God in an acceptable manner? And if they offered sacrifices they must be authorized by ordination. We read in Genesis, that Abel brought of the firstlings of the flock and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect to Abel and to his offering. And, again, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it he being dead, yet speaketh. How doth he yet speak? Why he magnified the priesthood which was conferred upon him, and died a righteous man, and therefore has become an angel of God by receiving his body from the dead. Holding still the keys of his dispensation, and was sent down from heaven unto Paul to minister consoling words, and to commit unto him a knowledge of the mysteries of godliness. 
And if this was not the case, I would ask, how did Paul know so much about Abel, and why should he talk about his speaking after he was dead? Hence, that he spoke after he was dead must be by being sent down out of heaven to administer. This, then, is the nature of the priesthood. Every man holding the presidency of his dispensation, and one man holding the presidency of them all, even Adam. And Adam receiving his presidency and authority from the Lord, but cannot receive a fullness until Christ shall present the kingdom to the Father, which shall be at the end of the last dispensation. The power, glory, and blessings of the priesthood could not continue with those who received ordination, only as their righteousness continued. For Cain also being authorized to offer sacrifice, but not offering it in righteousness, was cursed. It signifies, then, that the ordinances must be kept in the very way God has appointed, otherwise their priesthood will prove a cursing instead of a blessing. If Cain had fulfilled the law of righteousness as did Enoch, he could have walked with God all the days of his life, and never failed of a blessing. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah three hundred years, and begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Enoch were three hundred and sixty-five years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now this Enoch God reserved unto himself, that he should not die at that time, and appointed unto him a ministry unto terrestrial bodies. Of whom there has been but little revealed. He is reserved also unto the presidency of a dispensation, and more shall he said of him in terrestrial bodies in another treatise. He is a ministering angel, to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation and appeared unto Jude as Abel did unto Paul, therefore Jude spoke of him. And Enoch, the seventh from Adam, revealed these sayings, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. Paul was also acquainted with this character, and received instructions from him. By faith Enoch was translated, that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a revealer to those who diligently seek him. Now the doctrine of translation is a power which belongs to this priesthood. There are many things which belong to the powers of the priesthood and the keys thereof, that have been kept hid from before the foundation of the world. They are hid from the wise and prudent to be revealed in the last times. Many have supposed that the doctrine of translation was a doctrine whereby men were taken immediately into the presence of God, and into an eternal fullness, but this is a mistaken idea. Their place of habitation is that of the terrestrial order, and a place prepared for such characters he held in reserve to be ministering angels unto many planets. And who as yet have not entered into so great a fullness as those who are resurrected from the dead. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Now it was evident that there was a better resurrection, or else God would not have revealed it unto Paul. Wherein then, can it be said a better resurrection? This distinction is made between the doctrine of the actual resurrection and translation. Translation obtains deliverance from the tortures and sufferings of the body, but their existence will prolong as to the labors and toils of the ministry. Before they can enter into so great a rest and glory. On the other hand, those who were tortured, not accepting deliverance, received an immediate rest from their labors. And I heard a voice from heaven, saying, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. For from henceforth they do rest from their labors and their works do follow them. They rest from their labors for a long time, and yet their work is held in reserve for them, that they are permitted to do the same work, after they receive a resurrection for their bodies. But we shall leave this subject and the subject of the terrestrial bodies for another time, in order to treat upon them more fully. The next great, grand patriarch who held the keys of the priesthood was Lamech. And Lamech lived 182 years and begot a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. The priesthood continued from Lamech to Noah. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold I will destroy them with the earth. Thus we behold the keys of this priesthood consisted in obtaining the voice of Jehovah, that he talked with him, Noah, in a familiar and friendly manner. That he continued to him the keys, the covenants, the power and the glory, with which he blessed Adam at the beginning, and the offering of sacrifice, which also shall be continued at the last time. For all the ordinances and duties that ever have been required by the priesthood, under the directions and commandments of the Almighty in any of the dispensations shall all be had in the last dispensation, therefore all things had under the authority of the priesthood at any former period, 
shall be had again. Bringing to pass the restoration spoken of by the mouth of all the holy prophets. Then shall the sons of Levi offer an acceptable offering to the Lord. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord. It will be necessary here to make a few observations on the doctrine set forth in the above quotation. And it is generally supposed that sacrifice was entirely done away when the great sacrifice was offered up. And that there will be no necessity for the ordinance of sacrifice in future. But those who assert this are certainly not acquainted with the duties, privileges, and authority of the priesthood, or with the prophets. The offering of sacrifice has ever been connected and forms a part of the duties of the priesthood. It began with the priesthood, and will be continued until after the coming of Christ, from generation to generation. We frequently have mention made of the offering of sacrifice by the servants of the Most High in ancient days, prior to the law of Moses. Which ordinances will be continued when the priesthood is restored with all its authority, power, and blessings? Elijah was the last prophet that held the keys of the priesthood, and who will, before the last dispensation, restore the authority and deliver the keys of the priesthood. In order that all the ordinances may be attended to in righteousness. It is true that the Savior had authority and power to bestow this blessing, but the sons of Levi were too prejudiced. And I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord, etc., etc. Why send Elijah? Because he holds the keys of the authority to administer in all the ordinances of the priesthood, and without the authority is given, the ordinances could not be administered in righteousness. It is a very prevalent opinion that the sacrifices which were offered were entirely consumed. This was not the case, if you read Leviticus, second chapter, second and third verses, you will observe that the priests took a part as a memorial and offered it up before the Lord. While the remainder was kept for the maintenance of the priests. So that the offerings and sacrifices are not all consumed upon the altar, but the blood is sprinkled, and the fat and certain other portions are consumed. These sacrifices, as well as every ordinance belonging to the priesthood, will, when the temple of the Lord shall be built, and the sons of Levi be purified, be fully restored and attended to in all their powers, ramifications, and blessings. This ever did and ever will exist when the powers of the Melchizedek priesthood are sufficiently manifest. Else how can the restitution of all things spoken of by the holy prophets be brought to pass? It is not to be understood that the law of Moses will be established again with all its rites and variety of ceremonies, this has never been spoken of by the prophets. But those things which existed prior to Moses' day, namely, sacrifice, will be continued. It may be asked by some, what necessity for sacrifice, since the great sacrifice was offered? In answer to which, if repentance, baptism, and faith existed prior to the days of Christ, what necessity for them since that time? The priesthood has descended in a regular line from father to son, through their succeeding generations.